How to Succeed, or Stepping Stones to Fame and Fortune, by Orison Sweat Marden. Chapter 13, Trifles. In the elder days of art, builders wrought with greatest care, each minute an unseen part, for the gods see everywhere. Longfellow. Think not a trifle, though it small appear. Small sands the mountain, moments make the year, and trifles life. Young. The smallest hair throws its shadow. Goethe. He that despiseth small things shall fall little by little. Ecclesiastes. It is the little rift within the lute that by and by will make the music mute, and ever widening slowly silence all. Tennyson. A pebble in the streamlet scant has turned the course of many a river, a dewdrop on the baby plant has warped the giant oak forever. It is the close observation of little things which is the secret of success in business, in art, in science, and in every pursuit of life. Smiles. Only, but then the onlys, make up the mighty all. My rule of conduct has been that whatever is worth doing at all is worth doing well, said Nicolas Poussin, the great French painter. When asked the reason why he had become so eminent in a land of famous artists, he replied, Because I have neglected nothing. Do little things now, says a Persian proverb. So shall big things come to thee by and by, asking to be done. God will take care of the great things if we do not neglect the little ones. A gentleman advertised for a boy to assist him in his office, and nearly fifty applicants presented themselves to him. Out of the whole number, he in a short time selected one and dismissed the rest. "'I should like to know,' said a friend, "'on what ground you selected that boy who had not a single recommendation?' "'You are mistaken,' said the gentleman. "'He had a great many. "'He wiped his feet when he came in and closed the door after him, "'showing that he was careful.' He gave up his seat instantly to that lame old man, showing that he was kind and thoughtful. He took off his cap when he came in and answered my questions promptly and respectfully, showing that he was polite and gentlemanly. He picked up the book, which I had purposely laid upon the floor, and replaced it on the table, while all the rest stepped over it or shoved it aside. And he waited quietly for his turn, instead of pushing and crowding showing that he was honest and orderly. When I talked to him, I noticed that his clothes were carefully brushed, his hair in nice order, and his teeth as white as milk. And when he wrote his name, I noticed that his fingernails were clean, instead of being tipped with jet, like that handsome little fellow's in the blue jacket. Don't you call those letters of recommendation? I do. And I would give more for what I can tell about a boy by using my eyes ten minutes than for all the fine letters he can bring me. Least of all seeds, greatest of all harvests, seems to be one of the great laws of nature. All life comes from microscopic beginnings. In nature, there is nothing small. The microscope reveals as great a world below as the telescope above. All of nature's laws govern the smallest atoms, and a single drop of water is a miniature ocean. I cannot see that you have made any progress since my last visit, said a gentleman to Michelangelo. But, said the sculptor, I have retouched this part, polished that, softened that feature, brought out the muscle, given some expression to this lip, more energy to that limb, etc. But they are trifles, exclaimed the visitor. It may be so, replied the great artist, but trifles make perfection, and perfection is no trifle. That infinite patience which made Michelangelo spend a week in bringing out a muscle in a statue with more vital fidelity to truth, or Gerhard Dow a day in giving the right effect to a dewdrop on a cabbage leaf, makes all the difference between success and failure. Of what use is it? People ask with a sneer when Franklin told of his discovery that lightning and electricity are identical. What is the use of a child? replied Franklin. It may become a man. In the earliest days of cotton spinning, the small fibers would stick to the bobbins and make it necessary to stop and clear the machinery. Although this loss of time reduced the earnings of the operatives, 
The father of Robert Peel noticed that one of his spinners always drew full pay, as his machine never stopped. How is this, Dick? asked Mr. Peel one day. The onlookers tell me your bobbins are always clean. Aye, that they be, replied Dick Ferguson. How do you manage it, Dick? Why, you see, Mr. Peel, said the workman, it is sort of a secret. If I told you, you'd be as wise as I am. That's so, said Mr. Peel, smiling. But I'd give you something to know. Could you make all of the looms work as smoothly as yours? Every one of them, mister, replied Dick. Well, what shall I give you for your secret? asked Mr. Peel. And Dick replied, Give me a quart of ale every day, as I'm in the mills, and I'll tell thee all about it. Agreed, said Mr. Peel, and Dick whispered very cautiously in his ear, Chalk your bobbins. That was the whole secret, and Mr. Peel soon shot ahead of all of his competitors, for he made his machines that would chalk their own bobbins. Dick was handsomely rewarded with money instead of beer. His little idea saved the world millions of dollars. The totality of a life at any moment is the product mainly of little things, trifling choices, insignificant exercises of the will, unimportant acts often repeated, things seemingly of small account. These are the thousand tiny sculptors that are carving away constantly at the rude block of our life, giving it shape and feature. Indeed, the formation of character is much like the work of an artist in stone. The sculptor takes a rough, unshapen mass of marble and with strong, rapid strokes of mallet and chisel quickly brings into view the rude outline of his design. But after the outline appears, then comes hours, days, perhaps even years of patient, minute labor. A novice might see no change in the statue from one day to another, for though the chisel touches the stone a thousand times, it touches as lightly as the fall of a raindrop, but each touch leaves a mark. The smallest thing becomes respectable when regarded as the commencement of what has advanced or is advancing into magnificence. The crude settlement of Romulus would have remained an insignificant circumstance and might have justly sunk into oblivion if Rome had not at length commanded the world. Beecher says that men in their property are afraid of conflagrations and lightning strokes, but if they were building a wharf in Panama, a million madrepores, so small that only the microscope could detect them, would begin to bore the piles down under the water. There would be neither noise nor foam. But in a little while, if a child did but touch the post, over it would fall as if a saw had cut it through. Men think, with regard to their conduct, that if they were to lift themselves up gigantically and commit some crashing sin, they should never be able to hold up their heads but they will harbor in their souls little sins, which are piercing and eating them away to inevitable ruin. Lichens, of themselves of little value, prepare the way for important vegetation. They deposit in dying an acid which wears away the rock and prepares the mold necessary for the nourishment of superior plants. It was but a tiny rivulet trickling down the embankment that started the terrible Johnstown flood and swept thousands into eternity. One noble heroic act has elevated a nation. Franklin's whole career was changed by a torn copy of Cotton Mather's essays to do good. Taking up a stone to throw at a turtle was the turning point in Theodore Parker's life. As he raised the stone, something within him said, Don't do it. And he didn't. He went home and asked his mother what it was in him that said, Don't. She told him it was conscience. Small things become great when a great soul sees them. A child, when asked why a certain tree grew crooked, answered, Somebody trod upon it when it was a little fellow. By gnawing through a dike, even a rat may drown a nation. A little boy in Holland saw water trickling from a small hole near the bottom of a dike. He realized that the leak would rapidly become larger if the water was not checked, so he held his hand over the hole for hours on a dark and dismal night until he could attract the attention of passers-by. His name is still held in grateful remembrance in Holland. We may tell which way the wind blew before the deluge by marking the ripple and cupping of the rain in the petrified sand now preserved forever. We tell the very path by which gigantic creatures, whom man never saw, walked to the river's edge to find their food. 
The tears of Virgilia and Volumnia saved Rome from the Voluscians, when nothing else could move the vengeful heart of Coriolanus. Not even Helen of Troy, it is said, was beautiful enough to spare the tip of her nose, and if Cleopatra's had been an inch shorter, Mark Antony would never have become infatuated with her wonderful charms, and the blemish would have changed the history of the world. Anne Boleyn's fascinating smile split the great church of Rome in twain, and gave a nation an altered destiny. Napoleon, who feared not to attack the proudest monarchs in their capitals, shrank from the political influence of one independent woman in private life, Madame de Stael. It was a little thing for a cow to kick over a lantern left in a shanty, but it laid Chicago in ashes and rendered homeless a hundred thousand people. The discovery of glass was due to a mere accident, the building of a fire on the sand. And the bayonet, first made at Bayonne in France, owes its existence to the fact that a Basquet regiment, being hard-pressed by the enemy, one of the soldiers suggested that, as their ammunition was exhausted, they should fix their long knives into the barrels of their muskets, which was done, and the first bayonet charge was made. A jest led to a war between two great nations. The presence of a comma in a deed lost to the owner of an estate $5,000 a month for eight months. The Battle of Coruna was fought and Sir John Moore's life sacrificed in 1809 through a dragoon stopping to drink while bearing dispatches. You do no work, said the scissors to the rivet. Where would your work be, said the rivet to the scissors, if I didn't keep you together? Every day is a little life and their whole life but a day repeated. Those that dare lose a day are dangerously prodigal, those that dare misspend it desperate. What is the happiness of your life made up of? Little courtesies, little kindnesses, pleasant words, genial smiles, a friendly letter, good wishes and good deeds. One in a million, once in a lifetime, may do a heroic action. We call the large majority of human lives obscure, presumptuous that we are. How know we what lives a single thought retained from the dust of nameless graves may have lighted to renown. End of chapter 13